best possible sharpness, lowest possible noise. In this video, I'll tell you how to get out the best possible image quality just through knowing your gear a little bit better. What a gorgeous morning. Hi, my friends. Very nice to see you. You know, whenever I'm out for photography and I see anything beautiful, what I want to photograph, I know exactly which settings I have to use on my camera gear to get out the best possible image quality, to get out the most sharpness, to get out the lowest possible noise and so on. And as I bought new gear recently, I don't know my, my new gear, obviously. And so I have to check out which settings I have to use in different situations to get out the best possible image quality. And so I prepared a couple of tests what I will do here right now. And then we will meet back in my office for analyzing them and I will share everything with you guys. And the most important thing is to know it doesn't matter which kind of gear you use. It doesn't matter if you use the most expensive gear or a low budget gear. You can do this test with each gear you have. And also if you don't have new gear if you never have done tests like that and you don't know which settings you can use in your camera you can also do it with the old gear of course and yeah I will not consider anything about composition here I mean yeah it's such a beautiful place but anyway I have to do these tests now and then I'm ready for going out for taking some fantastic photographs so let's go So I'm back now in my office, obviously, everything worked perfectly and yeah, I, I took, I think it felt like a thousand photographs or something like this, uh, I think at least 700, <laughs> I'm not sure, but however, it took me really, really long to analyze everything. And yeah, there are some things I'm totally surprised about, so I'm really excited to share everything with you here. I will explain you each test I made, how I analyzed them and also what I will do with these results, how I will change my photography afterwards. And so the first test is all about lens sharpness. And this is quite interesting, to be honest. I often saw this in my workshops, that lots of photographers don't really know how far they can go with the apertures, for instance. I remember especially at one guy, I think he had two different apertures he used. The one was 5.6 for woodland photography and the other was f8 for wister photography. To be honest, if you work like that, you are really, really limited to your possibilities. It is such a big advantage to know exactly to which aperture I can go to get out amazingly sharp images. And there were especially two different types of blurriness I'm interested about. And the first of that is diffraction. You know when the aperture reflects light to the center of the lens, we get everything a little bit more blurry and the more we close the aperture, the higher is this effect of blurriness of that refraction. And it ends up in a blurry photograph over the entire frame. And the second thing I looked at the same first test is the sharpness of the corners of my photograph. So if you don't know how far you can go with the aperture, this test will really help you out. What I've done is I made test shots from f2.8 up to f22. This is my entire range of apertures. And I made these multiple times, by the way. First, I focused to the distance, then I focused to the foreground, and I did this with three different focal lengths with the shortest focal length, with the longest, and also with the mid range focal length. These are quite a lot of test shots, to be honest, but Trust me, it's really, really worth the effort. And then I compared all these shots and I wanted to find out three different things for this first test. The first thing is I wanted to find the sweet spot of sharpness of each lens. I wanted to find out the aperture range what leads into pinch up photographs 
and I wanted to find out the aperture range what leads into acceptable sharp photographs. And so usually I always work inside the pin sharp range obviously, but when the conditions force me to go out of this pin sharp range, I know exactly how far I can go until my photographs will get just rubbish. So I'm always working inside a totally safe range of apertures. So before I'll show you the results of my new lenses now, just let me tell you, these lenses are just amazing, really. I knew that the, the quality is really good of, of the Sony G Master lenses, but yeah, I, I really never expected that they would have this high quality, so really absolutely stunning. It was quite difficult to find a sweet spot for the lenses, to be honest. So what are the results of my free lenses? And when we have a look at my 16 to 35 2.8 lens, the sweet spot, it was really difficult to find, to be honest, it was around about F9. And what, I, what I've done is I just compare test shots. So what I can recommend here is don't only compare F8 with F9 and F9 with F10, also compare F8 with F10 or F8 with 11 and so on. So it's a little bit more easy to see the differences, especially when you have really, really sharp lenses. And what I also found out is at f2.8 and 3.5, the sharpness is acceptable for me. Just a tiny bit of, of softness is in the edges, but it's acceptable. Then I also saw, and, and this is amazing by the way, from f4 to f16, everything is pin sharp. This is an amazing range, f4 to f16. Incredible, isn't it? So what I also found out is that at f16, the corners get a tiny bit softer, but it's still okay, so I can totally come away with it. It's, it's nothing what I really will have an impact to my photography afterwards. And at f18, we get a little bit of diffraction, but it's also totally okay. And at f20 and 22, the diffraction is a little bit too much, so I will not use these two apertures. And so this finally means the acceptable usage is between f2.8 and f18. And we get out even pin sharp photographs from f4 to f16. That's amazing, isn't it? Just to give you a comparison. At my old ultra wide angle lens, I had a pin sharp range from f9 to f13 and an acceptable range from f8 to f16. And I have to say, I was quite happy with this lens. So, really incredible. Now I can cover nearly the entire range of apertures. Amazing. <laughs> Sorry for using this word so often in this video, but yeah, it is how it is. So this was my 16 to 35 millimeters lens. Let's just have a quick look at my other two lenses. So my 24 to 70 f 2.8 lens has a sweet spot of sharpness at f10. And I have a pin sharp range from f 2.8 to f14. And even the acceptable range is from f 2.8 to f20. The entire, the entire range, obviously. <laughs> Just f22 is not in the acceptable range. And it gets a little bit more complicated with my 70 to 200 millimeters lens. So I also did the same test for all three lenses. And as already mentioned, I, I did this with three different focal lengths, in this case with 70 millimeters, with 200 millimeters, and also with, I think it was at 127 millimeters. And there was no noticeable difference between the other lenses on the focal length, but there was quite a significant difference on the long lens. So the sweet spot of sharpness for all focal length was at f8, and also the pin sharp usage was between f2.8 and f14. And there's just a difference in the acceptable range. So at 70 millimeters, the acceptable sharpness was between f2.8 and f18. But up from a medium focal length, and I tested here with 127 millimeters, I can even go to f20. It's absolutely amazing, isn't it? And I did the same test with all three focal lengths, also with my teleconverter. I wanted to test out my teleconverter that I get an idea how good it is. I expected, of course, that the quality would go down a little bit, but also here, I, I'm really blown away. I didn't expect that the quality would be that good with the teleconverter on. I have the same results with the teleconverter as without the teleconverter. Incredible. So this was the first test and I have already to say here, I'm totally blown away from my new lenses. The second test is just a quick addition to the first test and I had a look at the chromatic aberration and the color fringing. And I just had a look at, at my, my range, what I tested already at my acceptable range because it doesn't make sense to, to test outside of this range, although I mean, this hadn't been all too many photos in my case. So how can we provoke to get color fringing and chromatic aberration? And in most cases it occurs when you have 
sharp edges and the high contrast. And so this is also the reason why I decided for this place where I, I took these test shots. And I think this was really the, the perfect place for, for doing this test because we had, we had a little bit of softness in the background, what's really cool for this test, but we had branches in, in the edges. And yeah, I, I didn't really find chromatic aberration to be honest. It's absolutely amazing. But what I found is a little bit of color fringing. So let's have a look at my 16 to 35 millimeters lens. As I already mentioned, I didn't find any chromatic aberrations, but at the shorter focal length, what I realized is that I get a little bit of color fringing up from f16. But this is still okay, it's totally acceptable, and it doesn't change up to f18, so I have no problem, I have nothing to change here on my acceptable range. It's a little bit different on my 24 to 70 millimeters lens. I get already a little bit color fringing up from f13, but it's also totally okay and it doesn't really change all too much up to f even f20. So also in this case, I will not have to change anything on my acceptable range. And for the case that you should do this test by yourself, of course, when you find chromatic aberration or color fringing, what is not okay, what you've determined before, of course, you should go down with your acceptable range, but it's not necessary here in my case. Yeah, Sony G Master lenses are really a bad example for tests like that. But however, I, I'm quite surprised from my 17 to 200 lens, to be honest. I wasn't able to, to find any traces of color fringing, neither with using a teleconverter. The third test is quite interesting, by the way. You know, I'm always interested in getting out a pinch-up photograph from the foreground to the distance, so a really high depth of field. And when I use a full-frame camera, a bigger sensor, I automatically get a lower or a shallower depth of field. And one of the possibilities to come away from that a little bit is to use the hyperfocal distancing method. I will not go into detail how hyperfocal distance works, I think this were maybe something for an own video, so if you're interested, just leave me a comment below. In short words, it allows me to get a higher depth of field, although I'm using a bigger sensor. The hyperfocal distance allows you to get out a higher depth of field, but you don't get the best possible sharpness. And so I've heard from other photographers that they struggle a little bit with higher resolution cameras. The arguments always were that the lenses would not be able to draw such a high resolution. But I thought I want to test out this by myself because it didn't really make a sense for me. Because when a lens is already able to draw a really, really high resolution, why shouldn't it work with hyperfocal distance? So what I did is I just tested it out by myself and the result is quite interesting. I made a focus stacking at f11 and I compared it with a shot where I focused at the hyperfocal distance also at f11 and I mean, yeah, the stacked image is sharper as we can see, but, but the sharpness of the hyperfocal distance image is totally acceptable for me. And we shouldn't forget we are at 61 megapixels here. And so this means for me, if there is wind or if I have any problem with the timing or whatever, so that I'm not able to, to use focus stacking, I will go for hyperfocal distance over the APS-C mode. This camera also has a fantastic APS-C mode so that I get a higher depth of field, but it isn't really necessary when I can go for hyperfocal distance. The only thing what I found out is, as I work with a higher resolution, it's quite a little bit tricky to find the hyperfocal distance because you know, when, when I don't find it exactly and I'm a little bit too close, everything gets blurry in the distance. And, and, and so yeah, this is really an issue when you have higher megapixels. I also tried sometimes and they also had some, some test shots what were just rubbish because yeah, it's totally blurry in the distance. And in this case, the APS-C mode had been much better. And so I think I will handle it in the following way. When I see that I need a higher depth of field and I see already the light comes in or anything, I don't have time. There's really a rush, I have to take the photograph right now. In this case, I will go over to the APC mode. I have a higher depth of field and I get a clean shot and I'm happy with 24 megapixels or 26 megapixels in that case. But when I have time, when there is no rush, no stress, whatever, I will go for hyperfocal distance and get more megapixels out of it. The fourth test was really important for me because, you know, before I worked on 24 megapixels, I've upgraded to 61 megapixels here. And yeah, I'm really happy with my filters at 24 megapixels. They are really sharp, they have no color casts. 
and yeah, I can always use them when it's necessary. So how did this test work? I just made a photograph without the filter, then with the polarizer and then with my ND filters. And what I use is I have a really cheap circular polarizer. It's amazing. I saw it by my son. My son bought it a few years ago and I was, I was really blown away how good it is. It's, it's a Valimax polarizer. I, I've linked it down in my gear list in the description. I think it was around 20 euros or 25 euros, something there like this. And yeah, it, it's an amazing filter. There's no loss in sharpness, no color casts, really a fantastic filter. And yeah, it worked really fantastically on my 24 megapixels camera and I, I didn't expect when you work on a 61 megapixels camera, I expected that I have to buy a new one and I had already a look at different filters, but yeah, I anyway wanted to test it out and yeah, I was totally surprised with the result. There is really no loss in sharpness. There is not really a color cast. I mean, there's a tiny bit of color cast, but it's solid through the entire frame. So this is definitely not a problem. It's really, it's really an amazingly high quality. And yeah, I mean, I will go on using it there is no reason to buy a new one. And I also tested my ND filters from Rolleye. These are really fantastic filters. They are out of Gorilla Glass. And yeah, I've never had problem with them. Also no color casts, no loss of sharpness at 24 megapixels. I also tested them at 61 megapixels. And there's also <laughs> really, really no difference. These are totally amazing filters and there's no reason for me to buy new ones. And when I'm out in the field, it's really important to know for me which ISOs are acceptable for me. A very important thing to know is that the amount of noise that is produced is totally depending on the darkness inside your frame. As it was too bright at the lake and I was finished with all my desks before noon, I went out again in the evening and this time to my local woodland for taking some desk shots there. And as I already mentioned, the less light the more noise. So it's not really possible to define an absolute value for the acceptable ISO. And so what I've done is I made four different series with different brightness with my old camera and also with my new one. And what I wanted to do is because I know my old camera already, I know how far I can go with my ISO. And so I just wanted to have a comparison here. So what I finally found out is when I can go up to ISO 800 with my old camera with my A6500 from Sony in brighter conditions, I can go up even to ISO 1000 on my new camera on my A7R4. And also in darker conditions when I can go up to ISO 500 with my old camera, I can go up even to ISO 800 on my new one. So I just know I can go a little bit higher with the ISO in future, but it doesn't make the biggest difference to be honest. So I know some really important facts about my new gear, but you know, even if you're able to get out sharper photographs and lower noise, it will not really end up in totally better photographs. So if you're interested about getting out a really fantastic photograph, I made already a video about the ingredients of a world class photo. I will link it up there. So if you haven't seen it, I can really recommend. I hope you enjoyed this video. If yes, please give me a thumb up, share this video with your friends, maybe on Facebook, Instagram. It would really help me to grow this channel. Subscribe to my channel if you didn't have already. Thank you so much for watching. See you next Saturday. Bye. I'm the landscape you need to see You are the artist I'll never be Stay with me and I have no doubt You'll make a painting that makes you proud